Hey, welcome. This three part series of videos will show you how to create an amazing lobby system like this one, complete with text and audio chat, all in Unity using Unity game services. This first part though, will take you through just the beginning and introductory sections of how to set up the new Unity lobby system and get it working in your project. So to kick things off, we need to make sure that you are ready to use the Unity lobby system. To do that, let's start by heading over to window, opening up the package manager and just making sure that the lobby package is among the installed packages in your Unity project. Now, if it is not, all you need to do is head over to this class, select add package from git URL and type in com.unity.services.lobby. I'll leave this text in the description and then hit add. Of course, I'm not going to do that because my project is already installed. Now, if you're installing the lobby system while it installs, head over to edit into the project settings and under Unity services, you want to make sure that your project is actually linked to an active Unity project. As you can see here, mine is actually already linked, but if yours wasn't, you could go ahead and create a new Unity project here or link it to an already existing project. Once we're done with that, let's go ahead and select this option to open up the Unity dashboard. And what we're going to do here is we're going to try and activate the lobby site. Now, you might be prompted to log in or even enter your payment details by Unity, and that's all okay, you can just sort that out. And once you're here, go ahead and select the multiplayer option at the top here. Under the lobby option, you just want to head over to the overview. And once you're here, what's going to happen is if you've not yet activated the lobby system, you will have a few options here. Um, to show you this, I'll head over to the setup guide options here. And there should be an option requiring you to turn the Unity lobby on. Once you find it, make sure to hit on. Once you turn it on, we're done with this and we can head over to the code. Now, all the code I'll be showing you here today is part of the lobby engine script that you'll be able to find by, by clicking the very first link in the description, joining my Discord and heading over to the resources section. This script just contains a list of functions and methods, the very ones I'm going to show you in this video, that allow you to properly work with the Unity lobby system. Let's get started. So the first thing that you'd want to watch out for is any script that's working with the Unity lobby system needs to be marked as async, such as this one here. This is because we're using our wait functions here and we want the code to wait on the execution of our functions without pausing the entire game. Now to get started, the very first thing you need to do is to initialize the Unity lobby system. So you can see here what I'm doing is I'm just calling await Unity services dot initialize dot async. And this will initialize our Unity services and wait for them to be initialized before going on to the next function call over here. The next function call though is simply us signing into the Unity authentication service, which is required while you're signing in to use a uh, lobby itself. Once you're done with this, this is all the code that you need to call in your initializer. And now we're ready to look at how we can go ahead and create lobbies using the new lobby system. Now, creating a lobby is super easy. Once again, the function that we use needs to be marked as async. And then there's, there's a bit of new functionality here. This try cut block is needed because the new lobby system returns exceptions for when it finds an error while trying to execute the code. Normally, exceptions can crush C sharp application, and so you just want to make sure that that does not happen to your game. And so, the way we do that is by having a try catch block where we catch the exception and do something that is simple to just handle the error. Uh, perhaps in this case, like uh, debugging and logging. The, the error like you can see I've done here. Other than that, what goes inside the catch block is actually your code that is going to create the lobby. And there's only two pieces of information that you that you absolutely need to have while creating a lobby. The first thing is the lobby name and the second one is the max players. And uh, once you have that, you can go ahead and create a new instance of a lobby object like I've done here. And you can assign it to an await function, which is the lobby service dot instance dot create lobby async. Again, this function just takes in the parameters that we talked about earlier, that's a lobby name and the maximum number of players. And once it has it created, it returns it to you and stores it inside of this function. As you can see, what I'm going ahead to do here is I'm actually saving the host lobby as this variable that has been returned because this is actually the lobby that I am the host of in this uh, particular situation. Now, there are a few extra options that you can add while trying to create a lobby. Uh, and these are the create lobby options. The way you do this is by creating a new instance of the create lobby options object. And inside that new instance, you can pass in your information as you can see here. First of all, it's whether the lobby is private or public. 
of city to public here by setting the eighth private uh, field to false. Then you can pass in a player for which kind of player is creating this lobby. Let's take a look at the player variable in a short while. But you can go ahead and also pass in data for the lobby to store. So this could be information like um, what is the game mode in this lobby. As you can see what I've done here, I've just set the theme. And because it's the dictionary, every object has a key and a value. So what I've done here is I've gone ahead and created an object that has the key as the word theme. And then the value is a data object, which is the type of object that you use to store data inside of the lobby system. Uh, and the data object has a few parameters. So the parameters are whether or not this is public to all members. Uh, you have a few options here. You could have this only uh, available to uh, members of the lobby. So if you don't want other people to be able to query this information, or you could have a private in which case it's only available to the host of the lobby. And the value can either be a string or an integer. So if I wanted this to be an integer, that's what I would do. Uh, but I wanted it to be a string in this case. And then you have this indexing option, the data object of indexing option. So these options are used to sort objects uh, when you return them in an array uh, while you're querying for a lobby. We're going to take a look at that in a short while. But for now, let's take a look at how you can create player data that is to be stored for your particular player while creating a lobby. So this is the function that does that, and it's relatively simple. The lobby system comes with an object type called player, which is used to store players that are joining the lobby. And in a player, there is this field here called data. So the data, once again, is simply a dictionary of objects that have both an identifier and a value. And what, I'm, what you can see I'm doing here is I'm giving it just one object, uh, which has the key of username. And then I'm passing in the player name, which we created earlier here as we were starting. Now, if you've watched this far into the video, be sure to scroll to the bottom, hit the subscribe button so you do not miss my next video where I'm gonna be creating this awesome lobby. And also make sure to click the very first link in the description to join my Discord because people are always jumping in there every single second getting assistance for network problems that they're working on and it's a lot of fun to have you guys in there. So during the lobby creation process we talked about this indexing option. So to see how that's used we'll need to take a look at how you can query a list of lobbies. So returning a list of valid lobbies is pretty easy using the new lobby system. As you can see, once again, the function is an async, and I am using a try and catch block to avoid catching the game. Uh, but the actual functionality is really, really easy, and it lies in this particular line. All I'm doing is I'm creating a new object of a query response, and then I'm calling an await function uh, onto the lobbies.instance.querylobbies async. So this returns a list of all public lobbies in my game. You saw earlier how you can make a lobby private. If you make it private, it will not be returned by this function. But this function is very, very limited, right? Because we cannot query for specific things. Perhaps we wanted lobbies with only a particular game mode, right? Now, once you have queried the lobbies, it's actually tricky to go through all of them, right? Uh, to do this, it's, uh, all you need is a for each function that takes in uh, every object that is of type lobby. And you can take a look at your query response dot results. This will list all lobbies that have been returned in your query response. And you can see here, we're just doing something as easy as logging the lobby name and its maximum number of players. However, the function that we're using to query lobbies was slightly too limited, right? We could just query all lobbies and we couldn't go through particular information. And this is where the query lobbies options comes in. This is an object that uh, that has particular information that you can use to filter through lobbies so that you get lobbies that have only particular properties that you'd like. So for instance, here I'm just creating a new query lobbies option. And the very first thing that I'm doing is I'm getting a count of lobbies, a specific number. So I'm only getting lobbies till I reach the number 25. Once I have 25 lobbies, I'm not gonna be querying anymore. And then there's the filter. So the query filter, it's a list of query filter objects that allows you to only get lobbies that match your properties. So to create a new query filter, all we're doing is we're saying we're creating a new query filter object and passing in a few parameters. So this parameter specifies what option this is going to run on. So that ran on the number of available slots, we can run on the created. And then you can see down here we have S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. And this is what I showed you earlier while we were creating uh, the lobby. You can pass in this particular uh, parameters and then they can be queried on when the lobby is being created. So assuming we wanted to query the game mode of the lobby, we'd need to do S1 because earlier as we were creating the lobby, 
uh, over here, we actually passed in the S1 as the theme of the lobby. So down here, we can go ahead and query for only lobbies that have the field S1 assigned to game night, and that will return our particular lobby. And then finally here, we have the query filter option, which is, uh, is it equal to, is it greater than, is it less than, is it not equal to, those sort of things. What you set here determines whether or not particular lobbies will be returned. Now, whether or not particular lobbies will be returned is nice, but then you can also decide what order the lobbies are returned and that's what this order field is for here. So you can see here we have a new list of query order objects, uh, we create a new query order object and we choose whether it is ascending or descending, so this can be true or false depending on whether you want it to be ascending or descending. And you can see here we're returning our lobbies in ascending order of when they were created. Of course, we have uh, every right to go in here and return depending on our N1 object or the S1 objects that we talked about earlier. Now, that's exactly how you list lobby. Let's take a look at how you join. So, joining a lobby requires very little information. Once again, you can see our function is an async and we're using the try catch block. But the actual functionality is here and it is very, very simple. So all we need is the lobby code. The lobby code is a shortened string of identifiers that you can get from the lobby by simply typing in the lobby object when you have it and then selecting lobby code. So this is this would be the code that the person who created the lobby would need to be shown to invite his friends to the lobby, right? Once he has the lobby code, all, he, all you need to call is the lobbies.instance.join lobby code, join lobby by code async function and give it the lobby code. Now we saw earlier while we are creating lobbies, we could pass in player information and we can do that as well while trying to join lobbies. So if I'm to just put this back here, we have the join lobby code by join lobby by code options object here and this takes in a player. So this is uh, similar to the player that we created earlier, we're just passing in the username. And so as you can see, we take that in and we can pass it into the join lobby by code async function. And this will save these player options in the cloud so that we can query them and take a look at them later. Now, joining a lobby using the lobby code is fine and all, but usually sometimes we don't want our players to have to share their lobby code. Uh, you can write very simple functionality to add the player to any lobby that matches the particular set of parameters using the quick join lobby option. So you can see here, once again, the function is marked async. We're using the try catch block. The actual function is very, very simple. We're simply calling the lobby service dot instance and we're selecting quick join lobby async here uh, to allow us to join the lobby straight away. Once again, we can get access to whatever lobby we join by just, by just storing it as a variable. And then we can go ahead and query particular information about this lobby once we're in it. We're just about done with the lobby system. There's only two more things we need to consider. And the first of them is how do you change information about lobby? So earlier we talked about creating a lobby and we talked about creating this lobby options object that you can see uh, right over here. And this object stores information about the lobby. Now, you can pass in a new one of these objects to change information about the lobby by simply calling lobbies.instance.updateLobby async and passing in the lobby ID and then a new update lobby option. You can see once again in the data, we've passed in just a dictionary uh, that stores keys and values for our data. Now, I will point out that if you do not want to change certain information, you do not need to pass it into this dictionary. So assuming our lobby had both the theme and maybe the region, if I just went ahead and passed in the theme object here, it would change just the data for the theme. The region would stay the same and that's okay. Now, once again, uh, what you need to do here, once you call this update lobby async function is you could see, I could call it like this, but then because the, it's, but then because it's going to return a new lobby object that has our information updated, I need to store that new lobby object in my previous lobby object. Otherwise, if I did not store it, I wouldn't have any record of the fact that this information actually changed on the lobby. There's one last weird thing about the lobby system. So the lobby system closes a lobby that is not uh, essentially ping within a few seconds. Normally that's 30 seconds, but we prefer to ping them in every 15 seconds just to avoid the chance of perhaps not having pinged the lobby. So what you can do is you need to write a piece of functionality that sends a heartbeat ping to a lobby every certain period of time. What I've done here is I've created a float value that is simply what I'm calling a heartbeat timer. And every single frame, what I'm doing is I'm reducing it by time to delta time. So essentially the time that has passed, uh, once it's less than or equal to zero, so this should be equal to as well. Once it's less than or equal to zero, 
set it back to 15 seconds and then I query the lobby system. So all you'd want to do is assuming you had an update function here. You just want to make sure that this function is being called every single frame uh, like this and it will query your lobby for you and prevent it from closing. So that's pretty much everything you need to know about how to use the lobby system. If you like this video, make sure you go ahead and hit the like button uh, below and also subscribe to the channel and join my Discord because people are jumping in there every single second, asking very important questions for their games and getting assistance straight away. I will catch you in the next video. Peace out.